for God's word this morning. Oh yeah. Uh, for the past eight weeks, we have been on this series we call Deep Waters. Deep Waters. We're exploring what it looks like to truly follow Jesus beyond just playing church. In the pool, you will find two things. You will find a deep end and you'll find a shallow end. In many ways, Christianity can be described the same way. There is a deep end and then there's a shallow end. For instance, Sunday morning worship is considered the shallow end of our Christian faith. It is a starting point. Of course, we're glad that you're here this morning, but you should know that there is much more to following Jesus than just showing up on Sunday mornings. Attending church is a good start, but that's not all. That's not all at all, okay? So when we say deep waters, that's a metaphor for having a deeper walk with Christ, deeper walk with God that goes beyond Sunday mornings. And for the past eight weeks, we have been looking at different areas that Jesus calls us to go deeper with him. And today, we're gonna look at one last one as we wrap up the series. Anybody ready? Okay, before we dive into that though, uh, I wanna tell you about what's happening next week, next week Sunday. Next week Sunday, uh, I will be here, but I will not be speaking because we'll have a guest speaker by name of Brad Wilkerson, Pastor Brad, uh, pastors a dynamic church in, uh, in Prosper, Texas called Rock Point, Rock Creek Church, I beg your pardon, Rock Creek Church. Uh, Brad is a good friend of mine, and he's also one of our overseers. And uh, he is somebody that I really want you to come out and hear because I know he'll bless you. Um, he comes to our church every year, and every year when he comes, it's a big blessing. So we're looking forward, and I am looking forward to his ministry next week, Sunday. I want to encourage you to invite somebody with you next Sunday uh, because the person you invite will be blessed just like you will be, and then they can have snow cone after service next week, Sunday. All right, let's get back to our lesson. Today, we want to look at how Jesus calls us, invites us to live beyond ourselves and live a life of impact. And I want to title today's message, From Success to Significance. From Success to Significance. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you for this opportunity to share your word with your people. Of my own self, I can do nothing. I rely solely and completely on you. Think through my mind, speak through my voice, give us ears to hear, give us hearts to believe, give us faith to receive, and let it be all of you and none of me. Lord, change our thinking and change our lives by the power of your word. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody say... Amen. When I was growing up, we were, uh, we didn't have much. As a matter of fact, I can say we were poor. Uh, so from a very early age, I desired to make something of myself so that I can help my family come out of poverty. Okay. And thankfully, I was good at school. I could manage a few grades. And uh, so my plan was that I was going to go to school. I was going to study hard, I was gonna eventually become an engineer and I'll be successful and that way it'll be my pathway to success. I, I desired to be successful, I wanted a successful life. So I worked for that. But shortly after I turned 18, I visited a Christian fellowship, just like this, except it wasn't on Sunday mornings, it was on Sunday evenings, and I listened to this brother's uh, dig into God's word and, and uh, just really unpack God's word and present Jesus in such a way that I had never heard before. So I became curious. I became curious about their version of Christianity, which was different from the version that I learned from my mother's church. So I was drawn to the Jesus that they were presenting. I remember one night in particular, a young man by the name of uh, Anthony sat me down and really explained to me, and for the first time I understood what it meant to follow Jesus and to know Jesus. 
That night, October 15, 1985, at about 10 p.m. at night, I said yes to following Jesus. And that one decision completely changed my life, changed the trajectory of my life. I remember from that point on, I was getting to about 18 years of age at that point, instead of just wanting to become an engineer and be financially successful, I earnestly started wanting for my life to make an impact. I wanted more than success. I wanted my life to count. I wanted significance. I remember many, many nights that I would cry and pray and ask God to use me. At that time, I didn't know exactly how he was going to use me. I had no idea. And it really didn't matter how he was going to use me. I was ready as long as he was, my life was going to be used for a greater purpose. I was in. I was ready. And I can say that since then until now, a whole lot has changed in my life. But the one thing that hasn't changed is that desire to make a difference. But the truth is, that desire is not unique to me. I believe we all have the same desire. We all desire the same thing. Especially if you are a follower of Jesus. If you're following Jesus, sooner or later, you're going to want to please him. Sooner or later, you're going to want to be more than just successful. You want your life to matter. And even if you're not a follower of Jesus, inside of every single one of us, there's still the desire to make a difference, to make an impact. Earl Pickett is a Christian chaplain who has spent a lot of time with people that are on the last days of their lives, they are about to leave this earth. And he wrote a book about it, and he says in his book that by far the two frequent subjects that most dying people talk about are relationships and impact. See, when people are approaching the end of their lives, they often wonder, one, did I invest enough time to build good relationship with the people that I love and who love me? And two, did I make a difference with the one life that I was given? See, what I find really sad about that is the fact that they are reflecting on these two questions at a point in their lives when it's almost too late. Too late. There's, there's very little, if any, that they can do about it. But the good news for us is that we are not on our dying bed. We have the time not only to reflect, but also to do something about this one important question. How am I making a difference with the one life that I have been given? I think it is a question that we all need to ponder now that we can still do something rather than wait until the end. I believe we all want to make a difference. I believe that if we were to give out a quiz this morning that says, do you want to make a difference in your life? Check yes or check no. I believe that every single person in this room would check yes. I find it hard to believe that there is anybody here who would say, oh, no, nah, I'll pass. Making a difference now, nah, not for me. I'll rather just be successful. I want to be happy. I want to be just get what I want. I don't care about anyone else. I don't think there's anyone like that. I find it hard to believe that. Why? Because we are all hardwired by God to live lives that count. We are made to desire making a difference. That's God how that's how God wired us. That's clear. However, for most of us. Even though we want to make a difference, the problem is often twofold. Number one, we don't know how. And if you're writing notes, if you're the type that write notes, and you should be, this is the time where you pick up your worship guide and you fill in the blanks. Number one, we don't know how. Or number two, we don't do anything. You see, friends, desire is never enough. If I want to shed a few pounds and be physically fit, right, 
What am I going to do? I'm going to need to do something about that. The question is, how, how? how are you going to do that? Well, the first thing is, I'm going to do some research, right? I may research some exercise programs and some fitness programs, and there's a ton of them. There's CrossFit, there's HIIT, there's Beachbody P90X, there's F45, there is uh, Pirates, there is Bar, Zumba, TRX, the list goes on and on. I'm going to research something. And then after the research, I'm going to also research the places where I can go, that, like the gyms, what gyms offer what programs. But watch this, after all of that research, I still haven't lost a pound. <laughs> Why not? Because it takes more than that, right? You got to still do something about that. Well, the same is true. Same is true. If you want to get a degree, you want to play a musical instrument, I don't care what it is, whatever you want to do, first, you don't know how, so you do what? You find out how. And thank God for this awesome thing that God created called Internet. Right? With the internet, you can find about anything. How many know you can learn anything on YouTube? All right, come on, somebody. You can learn, you can learn about anything on YouTube, right? So without ever stepping, setting foot out outside of my door, I can find out everything that I need to know about how to enroll in school, what school, what program I'm interested in. I can find out about the scholarships, the grants, the, the financial aid, all of that. But my point is, after all of that, I still actually have to what? Do something about it. In reality, that is where the problem lies. A vast majority of us. It's not that we don't know what to do. It's that we do nothing. In fact, sometimes knowing what to do can be the problem. Sometimes we can become overwhelmed simply by how much we know and by how much we have to do. That we end up doing nothing. It's called analysis paralysis. It's a real thing. It's when too much analysis leads to paralysis. It's called overanalyzing. And let me check up on my friends today. How many of you are overthinkers in the house? That's right. You think about it and then you think about it some more. And then you think about it and then you think about it and then you think about it. And I don't have enough time to tell you how many times you think about it. <laughs> right? That's what happens when you overanalyze. You end up doing nothing. But sometimes we do nothing because we procrastinate. How many procrastinators do we have in the house? I'll do it next Sunday. I'll do it next week. Then next week turns to next month. Next month turns to next year. Next year turns to a lifetime. And it is still not done. Right? We get overwhelmed. Think about it. Think about all the issues in the world that we can care about. Homelessness and lack of affordable housing, opiate addiction, the epidemic of depression and mental illness, especially among young people, loneliness, racial injustice, people who are incarcerated, hunger, and food insecurity, political tensions, especially in a year like this when there is the upcoming presidential election, health care, immigration, elderly care, climate change, wildfires, flooding, disease, abortion, unemployment, human trafficking, the threat of artificial intelligence, which is about to take all our jobs, inflation, the economy, threats to democracy, national security, conspiracy theory, children with special needs, suicide prevention, teenage pregnancy, orphans, domestic violence, corruption, police brutality, drunk driving, sexual assault, crime rate. Where do you want me to start? Which one do you want to leave out? They're all important, not to talk about global issues like the war in Ukraine, the war in Gaza, tension in the Middle East, access to drink, clean drinking water, lack of access to education, droughts in parts of Africa, genocide and anti-Semitism. The list goes on and on. What? should I care about? 
And what happens is, if you're not careful, you get overwhelmed simply by the enormity of the need and the complexity of the problem. And you throw your hands up in the air and do nothing. Because you're thinking, very easily so, that even the little that you can do won't even move the needle, make any difference, so what's the point even trying? Now, if you feel that way, I get it. I get it. Honestly, I do sometimes feel that way too. But I would like to remind you of a quote by Christine Todd Whitman, who said that anyone who thinks that they are too small to make a difference have never spent a night in a room with a mosquito. <laughs> Think about that. As small as it is, it can totally ruin your night. We can't possibly do it all, but we can do something. You see, you'd be amazed what God can do through one small act of obedience. When I think about our impact, when I think about our significance, the difference that we can make, I think about something that Jesus said in Ma Matthew chapter 5, beginning from verse 13 to 14. Jesus said these words, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? And says no. It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. And then he said, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Think about that. Think about what salt does. When I think about the function of salt, I realize that just a little bit of salt that you sprinkle on your food, it changes the flavor and the taste of that food. That's called impact. That's, that's called making a difference. The same is true of light. Just a little bit of light in a dark room can make a huge difference. Am I right? Make a huge difference. Imagine that you have your little light and you shine your little light and I shine my little light and he shines his little light and she shines her little light and together we shine our little light and all of a sudden it's not just a little light anymore. It's a big glow. That's the difference that little things can make. Paul, the great apostle, explains in Ephesians chapter 2 that this is the very reason God left us in this planet after he saved us. He left us here so that we can make a difference. Here's what Paul says in Ephesians 2. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Verse 10 says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, check this out, so we can do the good things he planned for us to do long ago. That's the reason God left us on earth after we got saved. He had a plan. And his plan was that we will be the light and we will be the salt, that we will do good on the earth. Notice, notice something. We are not saved by what we do. We are saved by grace. We're not saved because we do good. There isn't enough good that you and I can do to earn salvation. It just doesn't exist. But notice something, that even though we're not saved by grace, we're not, I mean, we're not saved by what we do, but we're saved by grace, we are saved to do good. We're not saved for doing good, but we're saved to do good, all right? We're saved so we can do good. St. Augustine said it this way. He said that grace is, not, grace is given not because we have done good works, but grace is given in order that we may be able to do good works. We're not saved by works, but we're saved to work. Did you get that? We're saved by grace so we can do good works. 
One Christian writer, um, Kyle Eidelman, he's also a pastor. He puts it this way. He says, our love for the least of these ones is not the cause of salvation, but our love for the least of these ones is the evidence of our salvation, is the expression. We don't do good so that we can be saved, so that God can love us. We do good to express how much God loves us. We don't do good so that we can be approved of God. We do good to show that we have been approved of God. Okay? So, Pastor Manny, why is this distinction so important that you're spending so much time trying to explain it? Here's why. It's because God doesn't want us to be guilted into doing good. When we do good, we shouldn't do good so we can escape God's judgment. We don't do good so that God can love us. We don't do good so God can approve us. No, we've already been approved. God wants us to do good as a heartfelt response to his grace towards us. Every person, whether you're a Christ follower or not, we want our lives to matter because God made us to want to make a difference. And the big question then becomes, how do you make a difference? How do you live a life of impact? How do you live a life of significance? Well, I want to give you three things today. And uh, if you're writing notes, then you can write this down. If you want to live a life of impact, number one, you have to open your eyes. You have to open your eyes. Making a difference begins with us seeing and becoming aware of the needs and the opportunities around us. When we open our eyes, we start to see people, not just as faces in the crowd, but we start to see them as individuals with stories and pains and hopes and aspirations and, and hurts and griefs. In John chapter 4, verse 35, this is what the Bible says about uh, Jesus. Jesus said, don't you have a saying it's still four months until harvest. In other words, apparently this is what people used to say at that time. Well, it's not yet harvest time. Give me four months. Four months. And Jesus said, don't you say four months? He said, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe and ready for our harvest is now. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, you may be thinking that the need is not right now or right here, but it is. It is. You just need to open your eyes. You see, it's amazing to me how two people can look at the same thing and see totally different things. Am I right about that? Okay. For instance, if you live in a place like Pearland, you might think that because it is considered to be an affluent area, that everyone is fine. You might... You might be tempted to believe and think that there is no food insecurity here, that there is no unemployment here, that there's no homelessness here. But you'll be wrong. You'll be wrong. There are many families in Pelan struggling economically. Every week, well, not every week, almost every week, we get calls from this church, calls from people in the community calling to our church, asking for help. And sometimes I get the opportunity to get to talk to them, to know their stories a little bit. And you'll be amazed to find that there are working families, people with jobs, like teachers, who are unable to provide for their children. You'll be amazed to know that there are children who live in cars and go to school. Or some that basically crash on the couches of their aunts and cousins and relatives. They don't have a home. You'd be amazed to know that they share the same classroom with your children. They are in the same club with your children, the same activities with your children. You'd be amazed to know that their parents are the ones that attend to you at the restaurant. They wait on you when you go to a restaurant. They probably teach your kids. They're probably in the grocery stores when you go to buy something. They're probably in the same PTA as you. And they may be sitting next to you in church today. 
But you will never know that unless you open your eyes. So, first, you open your eyes. But second, you open your heart. You open your heart. It's one thing to notice a need. It's another thing to have the heart that wants to do something about the need. Some people just talk about the need. But when you open your heart, you move from just seeing something to actually doing something. You move from just observation to engagement, to compassion, to, to, to genuine interest to make a difference. You see, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, in the NIV, it says this, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they, uh, they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Take note of that verse. When he, talking about Jesus, saw the crowd, he had to see them first. It's hard to have compassion to a people that you don't see. We look through people, we look over people, we don't see people. Jesus saw them, then he had compassion on them. You first have to see me to have compassion on me. And I'm always amazed when we look at situations and, and we don't see the need in front of us. For instance, for instance, when you see a homeless person, what is the first thing that you think about? Do you clench your purse and try to walk the other way? because you're afraid that you might get robbed? Do you look straight ahead and avoid eye contact by all means necessary because you don't want them to talk to you? All right, what do you do? Do you think to yourself when you see a homeless person, do you think to yourself, I wonder what kind of drugs they are on that made them homeless? Do you think that they're gonna hurt you? Or do you think to yourself, gosh, I wonder when was the last time they had a good meal? See, the difference in what you think is determined by how open your heart is. See, our hearts can sometimes judge people very quickly. We can judge people based on our experiences, based on what they look like, based on what we see, and based on what we have heard. But the truth is sometimes we are off, totally off, way off. That homeless person, could have been maybe a veteran who has PTSD or even someone with a physical disability that has prevented them from working or handling the daily rigors of life. That could have been someone who survived a severe illness like cancer or, or something else. And in the process, they ended up racking up so much debt due to medical bills that they ended up health, endless, homeless. And I'm not making this up. I say this because I have met people like that. There are a myriad of reasons why people could end up handless that has nothing to do with drugs or crime. Or maybe you know somebody who is always having financial problems. It seems like they never have enough. They're always struggling. What is the first thing that comes to your mind? If we're not careful, we think, we quick to think, well, they're just in that situation because they're not responsible with their money. If they only would be more responsible and manage their money well, they won't have this much needs. Be honest. Have you ever thought that? Because the truth is, I have. I have thought that. But the truth is, we don't know the full story, do we? There are many people who live very frugally, but they just don't make enough money. And here's one thing I can tell you about money. If you don't have enough, it doesn't matter how much, how much you manage it. If it's not enough, it's not enough. Some people don't make enough to cover their rent and food and medicine and other necessities. And we make judgment about them without taking the time to know about their situation. I want to give you a challenge today. I challenge you today. The next time you see a homeless person, I know your heart is about to beat out of your chest right now. But I want you to try this. I want you to walk over to them, pull down your window, and say, how are you doing today? 
and ask them, what's the story? How did you end up here? They're not going to be offended. You might just be surprised at what you hear. The next time you see somebody having financial need, not having enough for their children, not having enough for what they need, I want you to do this before you think anything. I want you to tell yourself, I don't know the whole story. That's my challenge. I dare you to do that. You might be surprised at what you find out. It might change your perspective. It might change your mind. It might open your heart. So first, we need to open our eyes. Second, we need to open our hearts. And then thirdly, we need to open our hands. We need to open our hands. Opening our hands means that we are willing to share what we have, even if it's a little bit, so that we can help someone else. We're willing to, to leave just a little bit less so someone else can have something. <clears throat> before we started this church, when we were preparing, like maybe a year or two before we started the church, we were preparing to start the church, our eyes got open to some of the needs in our community. <laughs> and man, it ripped me apart. We found out through the school system, the PLN and Alvin ISD, we found out that there are every single year that there are hundreds of students who do not have enough school supplies for their school work. We also found out that there are hundreds, you heard me right, hundreds of families who are homeless, walking homeless, parents walking, but they don't have a home. They don't have a home. Call the school district and ask. You'll be amazed. Okay. The question is, how do we expect these kids to perform if they don't even have what they need? And so, even though we didn't have a church yet, we were not a church at that time, our team decided that we were going to do something about it and that we were going to be the kind of church that is sold in the community. So we purchased 50 backpacks and we gave it to 50 students who needed them. We thought we were just doing just a little thing and then before we knew it, schools were calling us up, a couple of schools were calling us up and saying, do you have more? Can you help with this? I would go to Walmart and load up my pickup truck with water and Gatorade and things and drive to the high schools and the middle school and give to the school because that's what they were asking for. We need water, we need this. And I was amazed at that. And, and, um, and since then, we've been doing that every year. Every single year, we buy backpacks and we supply to children. And for the first time this year, we now have an outreach team in our church, okay? We have a team of people in our church that are now doing outreach and they're researching needs in the area and they're having all these dreams and they started dreaming and they came to me with some dreams and they said, what would it look like if we did more than just backpack this year? If we added supplies like pencils and pens and crayons and, and all these things. And they said, what if we did more than 50 backpacks given how much need there is? What if we did 200 backpacks? What if we shoot for that? Of course, you know what I said? I said, yes. I said, yes. And then they said, what if instead of just the church doing it the way we've been doing it the last three years, just doing it quietly, what if we told our congregation about it? And what if we invited them to be part of it? And I said yes to that because I did not think or believe that anyone would think that that's a bad idea. So we may not be able to do everything, but we can do something. And we want to do something. And when you came in this morning, there's a box in the lobby. You got to pardon us for this because the box is really small. But next Sunday, it's going to be a big box, okay? You're not going to miss the box, all right? Today, you might have to need a flashlight to find the box. But next Sunday, you will not miss the box. It will be a big box. We'll have a box in the lobby next Sunday. And we're going to collect backpacks and school supplies because we want to make an impact in the lives of children this year. And then on July 27, we're going to have a back to school bash, all right? We're gonna bring a tent out in the parking lot and we're gonna invite the community and we're gonna give out backpacks and we're gonna take them to schools and make sure that children have what they need because we believe Jesus would do the same. 
So why am I telling you this today, church family? I'm telling you this because I want to give you a chance to get involved. All right? We want to bless some students. And we want to give you a chance to get involved. Starting tomorrow, when you go grocery shopping, would you please just grab a, a thing or two, a backpack or two, a crayon or two? Would you please grab some things? Okay? And then next Sunday when you come to church, just drop it in the box that will be in the lobby. There will be one box for a backpack. There will be another box for supplies. Just drop it in there every Sunday for five weeks until July 27. All right? And if you want to know what things you can buy, we have a list of the supplies. On your way out, just ask at the guest services table. There should be a list there. Just grab one. And you'll have all the list, all, all the things that you can buy. So we open our eyes, we open our hearts, and we open our hands. God's word tells us what happens when we do that, when we open our hands. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24, here's what the scripture says. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. That's a mystery. You thought the man who gave would be the one who ends up poor. You thought the man who was holding so tight would be the one who ends up rich. But that's not how it works in God's economy. He says a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Now, I said this last Sunday. Let me say it one more time. We do not teach, neither do we believe, that when you give God $1,000, God's going to multiply it and give you $10,000. We don't teach that here. We don't teach that when you give $419, you can claim the blessing of, the, of uh, Philippians 419. Did I have my preacher's voice on? All right. Did I have the preacher's voice on? All right. We don't believe that if you give God 638, that you can claim the blessings of Luke 638. No, that's a scam. That's not the gospel. That's a scam. We don't believe that. We don't teach that. However, we do believe that generosity leads to blessing. Because the Bible says so. We do believe that God has a way. God has a way of blessing you so that you don't come short when you give. <laughs> but instead, you gain even more. God has different ways of doing that. Sometimes he does it through material things like money. Sometimes he does it through non-material things. And sometimes he does it through both. This is not in your, in your notes. But Proverbs 28 verse 27 says, Whoever gives to the poor will what? Talk to me, church, will what? Do you believe God's word? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. But Pastor Manny, how does that work? I give and I'm not short. Here's how it works. So let's say you have $1,000 and you take out $100 and you give, right? Naturally, you're left with 900 and anybody with a pound of cents will say that 900 is less than 1,000. Am I right? But here's what happens. God's blessing on 900 can make 900 go further than 1,000 without God's blessings. How many believe that? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. But our motive should never be to give just so we can receive. Because then we are in a transactional relationship with God. Our motive should be that we want to be the light and the salt in the world. That is the call that Jesus gave us. And if you are following Jesus, and I suspect you, you are. I believe you are. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here week after week. If you are following Jesus, sooner or later, you will go from chasing after success and you start to chase significance. You start to want to live a life that makes a difference. Sooner or later, you're going to go from success to significance. Did you receive it today? Dear Father, thank you so much that you've given us what we don't deserve. God, when we did not deserve grace, you gave us grace. God, you've been good to us, better to us than we have been to our own self. Lord, when we didn't see a way, you made a way. When we had nobody, you were the one in our corner. God, when we lost hope, you became our 
hope. You lifted us up when we were down. God, you saved us when we were far from you. And today, you call us to be your voice, to be your hands and your feet in the world. You called us to represent you. What an honor. What a privilege. God, if there be anybody who is in this audience today who has not made Jesus Christ the Lord of their lives, God, I pray that today will be the day that they say yes. That this will not be another day they hear another sermon and just go home. That God, somebody will submit to the Lordship of Jesus and the change can begin and the program can get started. Lord, thank you for what you do in this assembly in spite of our imperfections and all our limitations. Thank you that each week you're changing lives. God, thank you for the future that you have for us on this earth. That we are more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens us. God, thank you that you're the one who heals our diseases. You're the one who sets us free. You heal our minds from depression, from anxiety, from all the forces of darkness. Thank you, God, that when we stand on your word, that nothing can conquer us. And today, we say yes to you. Yes. Whatever the answer, whatever the question is, whatever the assignment is, Whatever the call is, our answer is yes. Church family, everyone, pray this prayer with me, if you will. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for inviting me into your family. Today, I say yes. Yes to your will. Come into my heart and into my life and make me yours. Do with me as you choose. In Jesus' name. And everybody say, come on, everybody say.